All right, let's do this. Uh, we have a super special lecture question today. It should be pretty easy. Uh, we do the same lecture questions across the sections, and Paul's been having a bigger problem with this at 11 a.m. It's not really a problem in this section, so it's basically a free question for us. Uh, but at 11 a.m., he has quite a few students showing up late. So, uh, so we had this as a lecture question. All right, everyone got it? One second. All right. That's <coughs> it. So today's all about live coding. Uh, so we're going to do more examples of recursion uh, today and Friday. It's going to be live examples, just examples of recursion and live coding. So let's do it. What I want to start with is revisiting the histogram example. Uh, so this was our histogram from last time. And I want to rewrite this using tail recursion. I said I'd talk about tail recursion at some point, and now is that point. Uh, so this works. It's a recursive method. And if I set a breakpoint right here and run my test histogram test, I'll run it in the debugger. Where am I? So we're going to stop once we hit the base case. And we'll see that we have quite a few frames on the stack. We're going to have a whole bunch of method calls that get us to that base case. And each method call has a separate frame on the stack. So we have four recursive calls. So for this one, we got the test with a list of size 3, with the values 1, 2, 3. For the first call of histogram, we have the full list of length 3. And we're going to make that recursive call. Remove one of those elements and make a recursive call with just the last two elements. Make a recursive call with just the first element or the last element. And then we hit the base case of an empty list. And then we can step through this and go back up the recursion. We can see where we're going to be with <coughs> that's the return of the base case. We can see where we're going to be. Is it? Ooh. What do we got going on here? <coughs> this should just be the base case returning. So the base case returns. And the partial histogram is just an empty map. Then we're going to get the first element out of this list, the element uh, which is just three. And then process this one element, add it to our histogram. And we're going to end up returning a map with one element. So partial histogram is now a map with just one key value pair. We've seen the value three one time. We're going to process the value two, return a partial histogram with size two. Now we added two. We've seen that one time. And then we're going to see one one time. And then return that histogram out to the main test. So we're doing the work as we're coming back up the recursion after reaching the base case. And we see all those frames put on the stack. So if we, and let me control which test case we're running. So if we have a histogram that looks, a list that looks something like this, and we do the same thing, I'm going to rerun the debugger. We're going to have quite a few frames on the stack before we hit the base case. <clears throat> Once it runs, we're going to see a lot of calls. We're going to have one call for each value in the list. The base case, we have a list of size 0. The, uh, the recursive step before that, we have one element, then two elements, three elements, four elements, five elements. 
we can see all the values in this list as we go up. We remove one element each time we make a recursive call. So each time we make a recursive call, or we have a number of recursive calls equal to the size of the list, or the size of the list plus one, I think, because one of the calls is size zero. So we have 24 frames on the stack. And after a while, there's a certain point. You know what? Let's actually do it. Uh, there's a certain point where we're going to run out of room here. So if I do list. I gotta remember my syntax for this. Um, fill. I think it's this. All right, I'm going to do it the, the low-tech way. Eventually, we're going to have a list that's too big that this method won't be able to work. I don't think this is going to be big enough. So this one will probably work. And we have a lot of frames on the stack. Still no stack overflow, which kind of goes to our point of it's hard to get a stack overflow error without infinite recursion. Uh, but we have a lot of frames on the stack. Let's get even more frames on the stack. Oh, come on, work with me. <clears throat> come on. Let's get a lot of them. I want to make sure it overflows this time. So we'll get a lot of frames on the stack, run this in the, the debugger, and we might not hit the base. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we, yeah, we need a lot. Uh, we need a lot of frames. We have several hundred, several thousand frames, it looks like. So quite a few frames are still in an overflow stack. Oh, we'll get there. Uh, test histogram. We'll just double it a few more times. There's a lot. There are a lot of values in this thing. My scroll bar is barely even moving. If we don't overflow the stack this time, I don't know, I'll be impressed, I guess. Error. There we go. Method too large? Wait. It's not the error I was expecting. <laughs> oh, come on. This is the worst, uh, the worst thing for live demos when you're trying to break something and it just won't break. Uh, it's the worst feeling. Like, I just want you to break. <coughs> and now my laptop's melting instead. Oh, come on. IntelliJ, stop analyzing the code. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm trying to undo some of these. Undo one more. Hopefully that gets us there. Now we're not overflowing the stack. Why? Why is this? Why is this being so hard for me? I just want to break something. Why? Just 
I saw that in the trailer. Just break. I don't want to do this without it breaking. Exception occurred. Stack overflow error, right? Stack overflow error. Maybe because I was running in the debugger, the debugger might have been trying to fix that issue. All right, so we got our stack overflow error. Let me try it in the debugger one more time. I would like to see the same error in the debugger. Oh, we did get it. I just had to scroll down. Stack overflow error. All right, we got our stack overflow error. That's all we wanted to do was to break this damn thing. So I got a stack overflow error. Now let's rewrite this same method. Of course, I expect my test to fail because I didn't, uh, I didn't actually compute the expected value. So I expect that to fail. But I want to rewrite this method using something called tail recursion, where the recursive call is the last step of the method. And then we're actually going to get rid of that tail, the stack overflow error. Because with tail recursion, if the last thing your recursive call does is return the result of another recursive call, the compiler is going to optimize that and collapse all the stack frames into one stack frame. That's our goal. So we want to look at this and rearrange this in a way that we can make that recursive call the last thing we do. So doing any work after the recursive call is not going to work. This needs to be the very last thing we do every single time we, uh, we call this method. The recursive call has to be the last thing. So to do this, the common thing we will see is that we want to use an accumulator variable. Because if we're trying to just return whatever the recursive call returned, that implies that the base case has to return the complete answer. If the base case is returning the complete answer, then there's no work to be done by, oh, well, let me reverse that. If there's no work being done after the recursive call by any stack frame, then that means when we get the base case, the base case has to have the full solution, that full map that we're returning. Our input here is only the input list. So this implies that we're going to want a second parameter. The only way to get information to the base case is through parameters. We're going to want a second parameter, which is going to be our accumulator variable, which is going to be returned by the base case. So let me rewrite this thing. Def histogram helper, which is going to take the list of ints that we want and also an accumulator, an accumulator, and also return the return type that we expect. So instead of just taking the list of data that we're handling, we're going to take an accumulator where we're going to store our partial answers that we're going to compute as we go down the recursion instead of as we go up the recursion. So we do need an extra parameter. We're just going to add it to our parameter list. And then instead of this histogram actually doing anything, we're just going to return histogram helper of data and then initialize our accumulator to the empty map. That's all we want this method to do. Then I'm going to steal some of my code here. I'm going to delete a lot of this and kind of start over with our histogram method with this extra accumulator variable. I know the recursive call is going to be the last thing. Histogram helper of data drop one of something. And I want to ask myself a few questions. My base case should be still trivial input output behavior. So if, oh, this is my borrowed code. So if data is empty, I'm just going to return the accumulator. And that's it. That's my answer. 
that has everything. By the time we hit the base case, the goals that have the accumulator <laughs> contain everything that we need. That's the entire histogram in that accumulator variable. Else, we hit our recursive step. where our recursive call needs to be the last thing that's done. You know what? I can just delete this. I think that's just confusing having the extra code there. So this is my goal, is to have the base case just return the accumulator, and each recursive call just return whatever the next recursive call returned all the way down to the base case. So the base case can effectively return all the way up to the method that called histogram, which is our test suite in this case. <coughs> our base case should return all the way to the test suite. So to do this, we need to check our data, do our regular things, val, uh, I don't know, element of type int equals data.head. Give me the first element. If element, if accumulator dot contains element we're going to do one thing else we're going to do another thing so if it doesn't contain it I want to create some map some map of int to int which equals uh, the accumulator plus a key value pair for element to one. <coughs> or my answer is going to be equal to of map int 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 equals my, and we saw this last time, so I'll do it fairly quick. I guess I could have just kept the cut and paste element mapping to in parentheses accumulator of element plus one. So I want this to be my new accumulator value. Maybe new accumulator would be a better variable for that. Uh, if I've seen the element before, and this to be my new accumulator if I have not seen that element before, I'm updating the histogram as I'm going down the recursion. And then what I want is answer here. Is this going to work? I don't think so. Uh, I want answer here to be in my histogram helper call. I want this call to be the very last thing. I have one kind of issue here. These values are created inside a code block. We hit the end of the code block. It doesn't exist anymore. So we need some way to address this. My favorite way to do this, and this will be more of a like, tip and trick thing. This isn't something you strictly need to know. But remember when we can put the conditional as the last thing that our methods do, and then that controls what's returned? What's actually happening there is the entire conditional itself resolves to the value of the last expression that's executed during that conditional. Like the whole thing just resolves to that. So what we can do is this fancy stuff right here is set our variable equal to the conditional. This is a perfectly valid Scala. This is a, a nice thing you can do if you have a, a situation that calls for this. I have a variable, and I'm setting it equal to the conditional, which will be equal to either this if the condition is true or this if the condition is false, just like how we return values that, where the return value is controlled by a conditional. Same thing here. The conditional itself actually resolves to that value. So answer equals my conditional, something different depending on the conditional, and then make my recursive call with that histogram going down the recursion. So now my recursive call is the very last thing that I'm doing. You can even see my icon here change from that spiral that goes down to an arrow that you know visually it closes in on itself to denote that we have tail recursion now. You see the symbol? You got tail recursion. <coughs> And usually you get a warning. Maybe that's the warning I have here. You'll get a warning that you can have a tail recursion annotation on your method. If it's tail recursive, Scala likes to see this at tail recursion to make sure that you and the compiler agree that this is a tail recursive method. Now we run our method. Not number guesser. 
Now we run this thing. Come on. It'll run eventually. I guess it's got a lot of processing to do. And our test fails, like we expect. But we didn't get a stack overflow error. So the map that we returned didn't actually equal this map that we expected because I didn't update my test case. But we didn't error. And if we run this in the debugger, we're going to stop at that base case and we're going to look at our stack frames. I deleted my I deleted my breakpoint. We're going to look at our stack frames when we hit the the base case. Instead of having thousands of stacks frames on the stack, we have two. So we have one with the entire list that is the call to histogram itself, which deferred to histogram helper, and we don't have any recursive calls. We just have one call that made it all the way to the base case, which has our final answer, our final hash map, which we can take a look at. The accumulator, by the time we hit the base case, has all of the values. And we can see how big the list is, actually. Uh, one, I had one in that thing over 2,000 times. We had the rest of these values, like 1,000 or so times. You know, roughly five, six, I don't know, 7,000, somewhere around there, 8,000, maybe 10,000. Uh, enough to overflow the stack. But when we use tail recursion, we don't have to worry about overflowing the stack. We're sharing all those stack frames. We only create one stack frame. So again, just to make sure I say this enough so there's no confusion, tail recursion isn't something you're going to be quizzed or interviewed on. It's not going to show up in the homework. You're not going to need to see that. But since we're talking about recursion, it's something I do want to talk about. It's something that's really helpful to know if you're going to start using recursion. Uh, if you have recursion where you need 10,000 stack frames, you have to use tail recursion. Uh, you can't get away with just writing a regular recursive method. Uh, the song ratings, conveniently, less than a, about 1,000 ratings on there. So you'll be able to process that file without using tail recursion. But if you want to be a cool kid, tail recursion is the, it's the fun thing. All right, any questions on this? I don't even have my phone out. Any questions on that example? Now that, I feel like that went kind of quick, so I'll let you look at the code a little bit. We, we have the same idea, but we changed the parameter list so we could set this up using tail recursion. Oh. Regular recursion? Yes. You just go down and then it's like one step back up? Yes. So with tail recursion, you're doing all the work as you're going down. I'm doing all the work, then making a recursive call. And then when you get to the base case, the base case can return right to the method that called it. It doesn't have to go back up the recursion because there's nothing left to do. So the compiler recognizes this and says, hey, you, you set up this thing called tail recursion. There's nothing left to do with the return values. You have no more processing to do. Let me just squash these stack frames and return right back to this method. Instead of having thousands of stack frames, where each stack frame gets the answer from the next stack frame and just returns that answer unaltered to the previous stack frame, there's no reason to have those stack frames there. Their job's done. They already did all the work. Without tail recursion, there's still work to be done after the recursive call, so we need to preserve all those stack frames, because those stack frames have a little bit of processing to do before they can return back to the previous recursive call. So, so the question becomes pretty much, are you doing the work coming up the recursion or going down the recursion? When you do the work going down the recursion with this, with tail recursion, the base case should have the answer. Without tail recursion, usually the base case has nothing. Like, uh, It'll have empty list, map, zero, whatever your base case is. It's still trivial input output behavior. If you give me no data to process and an accumulator that has the answer, I'm just going to return the answer. And then my logic should be sound here. Do some work and then let the, uh, and then let the recursive call do the rest of the work with the assumption that it'll do the proper thing.
I'm not connected. Why am I not connected? <clears throat> I'm thinking nobody's actually talking. It's UB's Wi-Fi connecting me to the wrong stuff. I'm not, uh, so tail recursion, sacrifice heap space for stack space? No, tail recursion just strictly saves space. It's saving stack space. They'll both use the same amount of heap space, which in this case was uh, the amount of heap space needed to store that list. But even without recursion at all, we still have to use that. I mean, you still have to store the list. You still have to store the resulting map. Those have to be stored regardless. So tail recursion is significantly faster. Not necessarily. It is a little faster because it uses less space. But uh, tail recursion is going to use so much less space, which will avoid your stack overflow errors is one of the big advantages of it. I added, I mean, I kind of added the tail recursion, tail rec uh, <laughs> annotation. Um, but I let IntelliJ add it for me. I just clicked the button that said, yeah, add it for me. But this is text. It's actual text in the code. Like that's actually part of my program, is that annotation. If we're passing the accumulator as an argument. Doesn't that use more heap space? It would use more stack space, because that's just a reference. The list map, these aren't, uh, these aren't our primitives. They're, they don't extend any value. They're going to be references uh, to objects on the heap. Those objects exist no matter what. Um, we will use, we would, could possibly use a little more stack space since we have two parameters. So each frame would have two parameters, two references instead of one. But there's only one stack frame instead of thousands. So we saved a lot of space. Doubled the space per stack frame, but we went to one stack frame instead of thousands. So we saved a lot there. If you didn't have tail rec, would it still work? Yes. The only reason to have tail rec is if I... If you intend a method to be tail recursive, if you add that annotation, like if I do, like if I do this, this is no longer tail recursive. You can see my symbol change. And I don't really have a way of knowing that I just messed up my whole thing. I just messed up my recursion, and I don't have tail recursion anymore. If you have this annotation, this is your way of telling the compiler, like, hey, I'm expecting this to be tail recursive, so yell at me if it's not. So if I have this annotation, now I'm going to get an error because the recursive call is not the last thing. So this is a way to get the compiler to work for you and say, hey, I need this to be tail recursive. If I mess up at all, please let me know and make sure that I'm actually tail recursive. It's not necessary at all. The compiler will still give you the same optimization without it. But it helps, the debug, it helps the compiler help you by letting it know your intentions. This is my intention. I intend for this to be tail recursive. Help me make this tail recursive. That's you talking to the compiler. Uh, but without this, it's still tail recursive. We still get the optimization. Compilation takes so long. Uh, but we still get the optimization. I still only have one frame on the stack, even though I have 8,000 elements. Still just one frame. Still tail recursive. I get all the benefits. I just don't get the compiler yelling at me if I don't uh, have a tail recursive method without the annotation. All right. We're feeling good about that? Or at least feeling good about the recursive part. If you don't understand the tail recursive part specifically, you know, that's fine. In your memory diagrams, even if we give you tail recursion on the quiz by accident, you should still write out all of your frames as though it's not tail recursive, by the way. We want to see those frames. We shouldn't be accidentally doing tail recursion, but again, accidents do happen. We might accidentally make the recursive call the last thing the method does. Uh, but we want to see all the frames. We want to see that you understand all the recursive calls going down the recursion. We're feeling good. I'm 
There's a uh, just another summary. Like we, a recursive call, we want to do one piece of work and make the recursive call that's going to do the rest. We're still doing that same idea that you'll do on your homework for the other recursive, uh, recursive stuff. Was the tail recursion the intended way for task two to be done? No, you don't have to use tail recursion on the homework. The intended way is to not use tail recursion because it's a little more complex to add the tail recursion. Uh, that's not the expectation. The expectation is to get the job done using regular recursion, even though some of you didn't use recursion at all. Grr. Uh, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this in lecture. Even the students who got away without using recursion on task two did still use it on task three to remove the duplicates from the song list. So I strongly recommend using recursion for task two, especially if you're not comfortable with recursion yet, so you get practice before you hit the bigger one on task three, because task three is the tougher one that is going to have you use in recursion. Uh, which, <coughs> after thinking about it, I'm sure there's a way to cheese that too, but I think the way to not use recursion for that one would be more difficult than using recursion. Uh, whereas for test two, I'd say they're about the same difficulty. Uh, but you're not saving anything on test three if you didn't use recursion. All right, so let's get on to our next example. It took a little longer than, than I thought, but that's fine. Uh, the next one, and I want to, I just want to steal some test cases because I don't want to go through this whole thing. I'm going to borrow these test cases. And what I want to do is write a number guessing method using recursion, of course, that's going to take an upper and lower bound. I guess it wouldn't even have to take this. And a function, which is going to say higher or lower. So the idea here is that we can call this function with some double, and it's going to be play the higher or lower game. If I guess a value and the number, the hidden number that this function is hiding is higher than my guess, it's going to return true for higher. And if it's lower or equal to, it's going to say false for lower. So I say 50, it says higher. I say 75, it says lower, say 62.5. Uh, That's what we want to simulate here using recursion. The twist here is that it's going to take doubles, not integers. So we can't actually find the exact answer necessarily. So to make it more clear what we're trying to do, I'm going to set up this number guesser test suite where I have numbers that are going to be the hidden number. I'm going to be thinking of a number between 0 and 100. And I want to test this by Creating a function, which I always get this backwards, number to guess greater than guess number. So if you guess a number, this function is going to take a double and return a Boolean. The Boolean is going to be true or false based on the relative position of the number I guess. If I say I'm guessing the number 50 and the hidden number is 100, this is going to return true because the number to guess, which is the hidden number, which is baked into this function, just like your song cost function, bake that map of ratings into the function. So the function got to use that map, even though it wasn't a parameter to that function. We're going to take the number to guess, which is a parameter of the method, and use it inside our function. So this is going to return true if the hidden number is greater than the guess. So true is our typical higher, false is our typical lower. And then we just keep guessing. Guess higher or lower, guess higher or lower, guess again, guess again, guess again. So that's going to be our function that hides our hidden number. We're going to call our guess the number method with an initial upper and lower bound, which would be, I'm thinking, a number between 0 and 100 for this one. And then some hidden number, which would be the endpoints. These are good edge cases, 50. And then we start getting into some decimals to make sure we can guess these numbers with some precision. And then make sure the values are equal to each other using some epsilon. And we're going to say that we guess the right number if the values are within one hundredth of each other. 
So we need some case where our guessing ends. We're going to say as long as we're within 1 100th of the correct value, that's going to be considered a correct guess. So that's our setup. We have our testing. I like to do testing live whenever I do live coding, but I'm trying to do two examples today, so we'll cut out the testing on both of these. As much as I like to make room for testing, I want to talk about recursion more so. So let's implement this method. We have an upper and lower bound and some function, which we can call it with a guess, and it's going to return higher or lower, true for higher, false for lower. So how are we going to implement this thing? I'll give you, I'll give you like a minute to think about it, or if you want to shout things out, that's fine. Uh, and of course, no vars allowed. Without vars, you would throw it in a loop and do some silly stuff. A loop uh, i equals upper bound to lower bound in steps of 0 0.1, guess everything, and then uh, when it flips from false to true, or true to false, you know, none of that stuff, none of that business. Yeah, recursion is a method that calls itself. If you ain't doing that, it's not recursive. Uh, in loops, so the terminology, a loop we would call iterative, and a recursion we would call recursive, would be the two ways of moving through data. Iterative or iteration or recursion. I missed that question the first time. Thanks, Nicholas, for getting that. Yeah, there we go. Choose a, a random number in between the bounds, then call itself recursively with the lower and uh, or upper bound updated, and if the number is higher or lower than the guessed number. Yes, exactly. Uh, and roughly speaking, this we can do binary search here. It's kind of a modified binary search. We get the higher or lower information, and we split our search space in half each time. Uh, the only thing I, I would update to that answer is instead of a, choosing a random number, we'll choose the midpoint. So let's code this up, and let's go step by step through our setting up a recursive method. So our base case actually gets a little bit tricky this time, not super, not overwhelmingly so, but our base case, <coughs> if, or maybe I should just ask, what is our base case? Either, so our base case should be when we, we've got a guess that we're confident in, and we want to return that guess. We're like, we found the number. Yeah, if it's not higher or lower. If it's not higher or lower. So the problem is our function only returns a Boolean. So if it returns false, if it returns true, what, one, what would be our base case? I'll let you all think about that one for a sec. The base case is actually tricky on this one. It's no longer a trivial input-output behavior. Uh, when we're done, and it, it gets down to my testing, so uh, let's make sure that part was clear, actually. My testing of saying, as long as we're within 0 0.01, we'll consider that a correct guess. We'll call that an actual feature of the method, not a feature of how I'm testing it. Since these are doubles, we won't necessarily get exactly the answer. Uh, but if we have our recursive step, what we want to do is find the midpoint and set up our binary search. Our midpoint double, which is uh, lower plus upper over 2.0, 20.0, it would have broke everything. Uh, we're going to check our function. We're going to call this on the midpoint. So this is our guess. We're going to say, hey, function, I guess midpoint, whatever the value of midpoint is. The function is going to return true or false. Let me call this higher, actually, to make it a little more clear. So if that, if that function returned higher, then I know that 
<laughs> the hidden value is higher than my guess, which means it's higher than the midpoint. So I want to make a recursive call that's going to narrow the search space, going to get closer to my base case, but take into account the information that the guess is higher than this midpoint. What this means is that the guess, the hidden number, cannot be anywhere between lower bound and the midpoint. I can eliminate that entire search space. So I can make a recursive call That's the same as this recursive call, except I'm going to update my lower bound, my new lower bound, since I know nothing can be lower than the midpoint. I'm going to update my lower bound to be that midpoint. <coughs> if my function said lower, my recursive call is going to be very similar, except I can now eliminate everything above the midpoint. So my new upper bound is that midpoint. I no longer have to search anything that's above that upper, uh, above this midpoint. So that is my new upper bound. If the guess was, uh, if the hidden number is higher than my guess, I can eliminate everything below that midpoint. So that is my new lower bound. I don't have to search any numbers below that midpoint. That is my new lower bound. That's the lowest possible guess that could be the hidden number. <laughs> So what's our base case? Okay. I, I'm confident with our recursive calls. If, these, if this returns the right answer and our base case returns the, the correct guess or a correct enough guess, then these are correct. We just return them. They're getting closer to our base case, maybe, but we don't really have a base case yet. And our logic seems sound. Find the midpoint, ask higher or lower. If it's higher, move higher. If it's lower, move lower. Base case, right? If yeah. math.abs upper bound minus lower bound less than 0.01. If upper bound minus lower bound less than 0 .01. 0 0.01. What do we return? So we have three choices to return, and they're actually all fine. They're all perfectly fine. Uh, we can return the upper bound, we can return the lower bound, or we can return the midpoint. I like midpoint just because it, it gets us uh, a little more a uh, little more precision. So we'll return the midpoint, and since I want my midpoint in both my base case and my recursive step, I'll compute the midpoint first, and then go into the recursive stuff. So no harm in doing work before your conditional, before your if else for your base <coughs> case recursive step. And why is this giving me a warning? Oh, duplicate code. It's because I, I have my solution in a different file. Uh, the solution to this was in the archive, uh, archive directory, if anybody was curious. Um, but apparently I did that same exact way before. Uh, and I, I heard you do the absolute value. We actually don't need absolute value if we can assume people are calling this. Actually, let's add it anyway. Uh, just in case somebody calls this with some silly input, I'm thinking of a number between 100 and 0. Uh, that's just going to hit the base case. Or would we want that to hit the base case right away? Yeah, I want that to hit the base case right away. So we're going to assume the upper bound is always greater than the lower bound. And if that's not the case, we're just going to return the midpoint and say, hey, don't give me such a silly range. You can't think of a number between 100 and 0. Uh, don't give me negative stuff. And our code down here isn't going to flip the upper and lower bounds. So we, we, if we're not given a reversed range, we're not going to reverse it and get negative numbers there. Uh, it wouldn't hurt to have that absolute value, though. So how are we feeling about this? Do we think it's right? Do we think it's wrong? Am I printing out the values? I want to print these out whether it's right or wrong. So let's uh, print. This isn't Python, so I'll put my ln there. And let's run these tests. I 
I'm feeling pretty good about this. Yeah, we pass. So we're not going to get exactly the values, but we should be within 0.01 each time. We have our base case, which is our trivial input output. Once we're within, which isn't as trivial this time, once we're within the tolerance, the accepted tolerance of 0.01, once we're within that, our search space is less than that tolerance, we know we're close enough to the guess that both upper bound, lower bound, and the midpoint are all within 0.01. They're actually all within 0.005. Uh, from the correct answer. No, that's not true. 0 .00, uh, 0 0.01 within the right answer because our entire search space is only 0.01. So even if the correct answer is either upper or lower bound, even the other one is at most 0.01 away uh, from what we're looking for. And our logic was sound. Each time we had the recursive step, we made a recursive call that used binary search. We checked the midpoint and then cut out half of the search space each time, just like we do in binary search. Uh, the only difference is we have some first order functions and we're looking for doubles in this. Uh, so we use the first order function, which is going to tell us if we're higher or lower, and then call that function to be able to guess that hidden number without actually having access to that hidden number. Because if we just gave the hidden number as an input parameter, well, I'm just going to read that parameter. With a function, we hide that a little bit. So we actually have to call the function and say higher or lower. I guess 50. I guess 25. And if we want more precision out of this, guess what we do? We just grab more precision. This will run a little bit longer. Not even perceivable. Most of that was compilation. And we can get closer to our values. We're going to be within whatever number I just typed. We're going to be within that many decimal places of correct. So we got, we got two good examples of recursion. On Friday, my intent is to do a, a more complex example. that will take up the whole lecture in one example. Um, but recursion, recursion, recursion. Are we feeling better about recursion in general at this point? Sure. All right. Uh, see everyone Friday.